Hello, Internet. My name is Abbas Yassin. Um, I'm pleased today to provide a uh, concise overview of the research investigations going on in my group through this presentation entitled Microscopic Characterization of Disease Progression in the Living Brain. So let's get started here. Um, I've established the Optical Microscopy and Neuroimaging Lab, aka the Omni Lab, here in the Bioengineering Department at Northeastern University. Uh, our, our research uh, involves uh, multifaceted investigations coupling principles from disciplines, several disciplines, including uh, engineering and neuroscience. But at its core, the uh, principal goal of our research is to innovate and apply optical imaging technologies and to investigate the onset pro and progression of uh, brain diseases, cerebral pathologies in, in the living brain, including Alzheimer's disease and stroke. Um, we employ a an elegant suite of different micro microscopy tools. Uh, however, uh, at its core, uh, our studies center around using uh, a suite of tools that was developed by uh, me and my colleagues during my postdoc work that, uh, that utilized life lifetime-based microscopy techniques for measuring uh, parameters such as cerebral oxygenation, mitochondrial energy metabolism, and microvascular hemodynamics. Um, we apply these methods to characterize the metabolic disruptions and neuroimmune interactions associated with disease progression in living brains of preclinical animal models. Um, and the, the key aims of our investigations are to, number one, uh, we, as engineers, we strive to develop and improve uh, instrumentation for opti micro optical microscopy in vivo. Uh, then we uh, seek to apply these these tools that we developed in order to uncover new insights into the pathological underpinnings of, of neurodegenerative disorders and ischemic stroke. Uh, lastly, uh, hopefully through the discoveries that we make, we're, uh, we'd like to use our observations to guide the development and to assess novel and robust uh, therapies and preventative strategy strategies for human brain diseases. Okay, so optical microscopy offers a number of different features. Uh, including uh, it's relatively non-invasive, uh, it's uh, it compared to its uh, other optical, Im uh, other medical imaging modalities, it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, the, the key benefits come from its unparalleled spatial resolution, uh, its versatility in terms of contrast mechanisms. You can look at intensity, you can look at lifetime, you can look at coherence phenomenon. Uh, and then there's a, a tremendous range of contrast agents available that allow for a very precise and specific labeling of different cell types. So uh, all of these key uh, benefits of optical microscopy make it really well suited to exploring uh, the etiologies of brain disorders. Um, you, it's, it's, it's vital that we use technologies that are uh, with this type of spatial resolution so that we can uh, look at complex biological systems at the cellular and subcellular level within living uh, living tissue, uh, and there's really no uh, no fathomable uh, organ or a biological system that can be regarded as complex as as the brain. Here, this this image of the cortex just illustrates how the brain function is uh, regulated. Is 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 it comes down to a very complex and intricate electrochemical signaling across um, uh, neurons of uh, different uh, with different specializations uh, that are vastly heterogeneous in terms of their morphology and their spatial distribution throughout the the uh, uh, the brain and, and the and even uh, small features of the brain uh, such as the cortex uh, which here we have uh, uh, a, an organ that would be about a few millimeters thick in the in a in a human and really only like one millimeter uh, thick in the in a mouse, uh, and even still, the the layer of complexity and, and uh, stratification is, is is still quite overwhelming. Uh, and an additional layer of uh, complexity comes from the fact that uh, all this uh, propagation of action potentials across different neurons is, can only uh, be sustained through uh, maintaining the microenvironment properly, and that involves very complex signaling between uh, neurons and other cell types and, and tissue types in the brain. Uh, importantly, there's there's very complex signaling uh, communication going on between neurons and glial astrocytes, along with blood vessels and, and, and cells associated with uh, with microvasculature, including endothelium cells, pericytes, uh, and uh, and smooth muscle cells. 
And then uh, yet another discipline comes from just regulating the environment and ensuring that it's clean and free of pathogenic uh, disruptions. And that comes down to uh, complex interactions between neurons and, uh, and microglia, the, the sentinel immune cells of the brain. So in the case of uh, diseases like stroke and Alzheimer's disease, they, these, these disorders initiate by interfering with one or several of these very intricate signaling processes. And then the diseases accelerate further by dynamic adaptations of, of the surrounding tissue to the initial pathological threat. Um, for example, in the case of stroke, some cells will try to adapt to the localized disruption of blood flow, uh, but this can often lead to secondary uh, reperfusion injuries and, and uh, further growth of the necrotic core. In the case of a very multifactorial disease like Alzheimer's disease, uh, there's actually multiple phenomena that set in over time scales, like the, uh, including the accumulation of uh, toxic amyloid beta protein, uh, misfolded tau protein. There's also a phenomenon like mitochondrial dysfunction, synaptic loss, uh, modulation of uh, cerebral blood flow, and, uh, and then a neuro uh, neuroinflammation and inflammatory response. Uh, it, all of these processes take place over the course of, uh, well, in, in the case of stroke, uh, these processes manifest over the course of several hours or days. And in the, year, in the case of Alzheimer's disease, they can progress in the, uh, over the course of several years. Uh, in both cases, it's very important that we intervene early so that we can preserve more healthy tissue and mitigate the effects of the disease. And to, uh, in order to do that, um, microscopy lends itself very well to observe these and other phenomena at the cellular and microvascular scale. Um, very importantly, uh, hemodynamic function is just, uh, just as critical as, as cells, uh, intracellular signaling between neurons and, and astrocytes. And as a consequence, uh, these, to actually get a very comprehensive characterization of, the, of these phenomenon, it's, uh, it's important to do this within a living brain because uh, these, these, uh, these processes can't be replicated in simpler systems like cell cultures or brain slices. So as a consequence, uh, we have to observe these phenomena within, uh, uh, within intact living brains uh, using preclinical animal models of human disease, uh, primarily mice and rats. Uh, the brains of these animals can be non-disruptively monitored following surgical implantation of a cranial window. Uh, this image il illustrates how we can repeatedly image the mouse cortex after, after implanting a cranial window, uh, then performing some extensive animal training, uh, and then developing an apparatus for head immobilization and training with, with a customized holder that, uh, that sits under an up, upright microscope. So that's the, uh, basically uh, a nice overview of the, uh, the applications that we use uh, with, the, uh, with the technologies that we uh, develop. Right, so uh, the lifetime-based techniques that we developed for measuring uh, oxygenation and mitochondrial function these are very useful to, uh, to filling key gaps in our understanding of disease progression. Uh, using these methods, we're now able to, for the first time, to look at uh, intra and extravascular oxygenation and specific alterations to mitochondrial functions within individual cells in the native brain environment. Um, we aim to utilize these methods to assess how different brain cell populations uh, react to pathogenic threats and their relative susceptibility to uh, disease, disease pathogenesis including the uh, accumulation of toxic amyloid beta or the uh, uh, or localized disruption of cerebral blood flow. Uh, in our investigations, we strive to investigate these uh, pathologies using multimodal microscopy. Uh, by coupling our lifetime-based methods with more standard peripheral microscopy techniques, we intend to measure multiple metrics of, of uh, brain energy metabolism, including oxygen supply and consumption and mitochondrial function, we aim to look at uh, micro, uh, microvascular blood flow, which is closely associated with that. Uh, we also hope to look at immune function and uh, neurovascular coupling, which is uh, uh, the standard way of describing the signaling communication between cells and the microvasculature within the brain, uh, which is a very dynamic uh, process uh, and, and spatially heterogeneous over time. Uh, so measuring all of these metrics within the same specimen is going it will yield a much more comprehensive understanding of, of the Perspective connections and possible interdependencies between metabolism and immunity and their disease related changes, which is of high interest to the neuroscience community as well as clinicians uh, in, um, throughout the world. So, here's a, a nice image that illustrates the benefits of multimodal microscopy. Uh, specifically, uh, we're looking at the cortex uh, of, a, of a mouse 
uh, after uh, an ischemic stroke has been induced by occluding this artery down here. So this image shows uh, it was obtained by laser speckle contrast imaging and gives you a nice il uh, illustration of the spatial heterogeneity of, of microvascular blood flow after the occlusion. This is a multi-photon image uh, of uh, an intravascularly injected fluorophore that uh, gives an indication of perfusion after, after the occlusion. Uh, and this uh, down here is uh, this, the same brain. Uh, we've measured uh, NADH autofluorescence uh, and, um, and its associated fluorescence lifetime. Uh, so together, all these images will illustrate how uh, after, the, after brain tissue has been uh, locally, uh, a local obstruction in brain tissue will cut off blood supply for a, a small swath of the tissue which receives no perfusion and uh, over time uh, there's increases in the amount of mitochondrial dysfunction that happens and this is essentially uh, we can dynamically uh, characterize the growth of the ischemic core and potentially uh, we can we can care, uh, relate or uh, compare how the stroke progression can be mitigated or, or uh, exacerbated uh, in, uh, with the administration of different uh, therapeutic techniques or uh, hopefully therapeutic techniques, but uh, or, or other mitigating factors or uh, accelerating factors to uh, worsen the, the outcome. Uh, so this is just a, a nice elegant system that we've put together using the technologies that we developed that will help us uh, much more comprehensively understand the uh, just the etiology of various brain disorders uh, over time within our preclinical models. So that's a, a concise overview of, of the work that we intend to kick off. Uh, when I said I established the lab, it would actually, that took place a, a few weeks ago. And as a consequence, we don't have a group photo yet, but here's the team right now. Uh, and uh, please note that we're growing and recruiting new members. So uh, if you have a um, uh, very nice background in preferably uh, physics or electrical engineering or, or neuroscience, I'd be delighted to talk to you. Uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, any, any interested students here at Northeastern, uh, contact us here at uh, OmniLab at northeastern.edu and please visit my website. Uh, thank you and uh, so long and thanks for all the fish, I suppose.